And God uh, told, told Eve that from this point on that you'll be, uh, women will suffer in, in, in childbearing. In other words, you'll have labor pains. And men, you will still have to work. They had to work in the Garden of Eden. But you're going to earn a living by the sweat of your brow. In other words, you have to work hard. But God still prayed to fellowship. Despite what Adam did in the garden, God made a sacrifice. And He clothed them with that sacrifice. Why didn't God give up on Adam and Eve? I mean, after all, He just asked them not to do one simple thing. Just one. Just don't do it. Do it. Do, 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 you know, enjoy the garden of Eve. Work at it. Have some fun. Multiply. Have kids. Enjoy life. Just don't touch Did it anyway. Why didn't God become extremely hard headed and say, just forget it? Because God prayed fellowship. God wanted fellowship with man. Let's go a little bit further. Let's go back some 2,000 years ago. When Christ died on Calvary's cross, the Bible said that God gave His only begotten Son. The Word begotten is the only one. There was none other like Him. He was the spotless Lamb. He was the perfect one. Nobody else. A sinless one. And God loved His Son so much. And He said, Son, you're going to have to go through the mockery. You're going to have to go through the shame. You're going to have to go through the crucifixion. You're going to have to die on that cross. And you're going to have to suffer for the sins of this world. Why would God do that? So that we could have fellowship with Him. Not only today, but throughout <coughs> eternity. You see, God craves fellowship. God desires fellowship with us. Now this is the fourth part of our message. What does God want? We preached this last three weeks. This is the fourth week. What does God want? And the reason why this is so important is, is we need to know biblically from the Scriptures what does God really want from us. If you go out there and you get a public opinion, you're going to have a list a mile long about what God wants. Let's simplify it. Use the Bible and say, God, what do you want? Number one, we talked about three weeks ago, God wants worship. More than anything else, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. God wants us to worship Him, adore Him, to fall in love with Him. More than anything else in the world. When you worship God, everything else will flow. The second thing we talked about, what God wanted was servanthood. He said the second commandment, the greatest commandment, is to love thy neighbor as thyself. In other words, be helpful. Be, be a servant. Christ even, even he would lead the example when He came down and He said, I, don't, I didn't come here to be served. I come to serve others. Christ came in form of a servant. When He died on the cross, it was to serve. When he went through the mockery and the shame, it was to serve. It was to serve the Father. It was to, it was to be a servant so that we could have eternal life. So God said, first of all, you want to know what I want? I want worship. And then I want servanthood. And then last week we talked about the third thing God wanted, which was evangelism. As we read in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, he said, that go, uh, go, and, go and, uh, uh, and teach all nations. The word teach there means to witness. God wants us to tell a lost and dying world about Christ. He wants us to support missionaries so they're able to tell people we cannot reach. He wants us to, to, to support missionaries in and, and, and prayers and in finances and everything else so they can reach people we cannot reach. But He expects us here to reach others by evangelizing or by witnessing. That's very important. But you notice they've got to come in this order. 
If you try to evangelize without worshiping, it's not going to work very long. If you try being a servant without worshiping, you're going to be burned out as a servant. It's got to come from worship first, servanthood, and then evangelizing. Now, step four, what does God want? There's five steps. Step four, this is what God wants and what we're going to talk about today, and that's fellowship. God wants us to fellowship with Him and with other believers. However, listen carefully. He wants to do it through a team. He wants to do it through an organization. He wants to do it through a group of people. This is what we call a local church. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus uses a word, baptism. He says after a person gets saved, then, then they're baptized. He said, then, then baptize them. He's telling the church, baptize them. When a person is baptized, it brings them part, uh, that they're part of the family, uh, part of the family, a uh, church family, and, and, and they're part of that fellowship there. Yes, it, it's there to uh, illustrate what Christ did on the cross, how, how He died and He was buried and resurrected. But it also brings that person into the family, where they can go around singing, we are family. I got all my brothers and sisters and me. Amen? Amen. And we're going to speak on the subject this morning of baptism in relations of how it, how it, it brings fellowship with God. Okay? So we're going to tie those two in this morning. But before I mention two things this morning about fellowship, about baptism, this is what I want you to leave with today. Being a member of a local church is absolutely essential to have true fellowship with God. Being a member of a local church is absolutely essential to have true fellowship with God. Let me explain to you real briefly what I mean by that. There are people today that says, you know what, you ain't got to go to church to be a Christian. There are people today that are saying, you ain't got to go to church to get to heaven. There are people today that says, well, you know, you don't have to go to church to worship. Why would you say something like that? No, you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. I don't think you'll do much worshiping without church, without a church family. I think you'll find something else to do. I would. So why would they even say something like that? You see, it's absolutely essential that, that as a local church, that, that, that we're here uh, as a family, it's, 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 it's absolutely essential that we have true fellowship with God through a local church. Let me share two things with you this morning about baptism. Because baptism is another, it, it symbolizes fellowship also. Number one, baptism is necessary and expected. Baptism is necessary and expected. There is a lot of confusion today on the subject of baptism. The concerns or the confusion begins with how to, when to, and why. Why should I get baptized? How do you get baptized? What's the right way to get baptized? When should I get baptized? Different churches have different opinions. Different people have different opinions. But this subject, you can really begin to stir, uh, stir up a hornet's nest, if you would, by meddling with baptism. 